begin with, right? Because if you have no constraints on your ability to increase the gain in these populations, why not just increase the gain at the beginning of the trial, leave the gain on <laughs> really high, you know, the whole time, and then you you would be able to have a maximal performance on both targets and that you would have no incentive. There'd be no incentive in the model to you know, increase the gain more at one time than in another time. Mm -hmm. So the real question is what the constraint is that makes it necessary to attend more at one time than at another time. Um, and in the in this first version of the model that we've published, the the way uh, that we implemented this constraint was by was by positing that well maybe there's some limitation in our in in the in the gain that's available to be allocated across these short time intervals. So maybe you have a sort of you know limited resource of gain that you can allocate across time. And if you allocate it all at one moment in time, at the next moment in time, you don't get it back again immediately. It takes some time for that gain to recover again to its kind of baseline levels. And that's how in, you know, in this version of the model, we could um, correctly predict the attentional trade-offs that we observe empirically. Okay, so I'm, so I'm so sorry, but unfortunately, while you were just talking, I slowly came to realize that uh, the stream was had been dropped, and I we were not on the we were oh, not oh, okay. being broadcasted. Okay. So, but okay. I only just now figured it out um, because of how much skill I have at YouTube broadcasting. Oh my gosh! Okay, so <laughs> uh, <laughs> I apologize for that. Um, yeah. Anyway, so I'm here live. Now I think we actually are live. See, I have, it's very bad. Okay, so sorry. So um, we're gonna have to take it from the top, I think. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Holy moly, I can't believe that actually happened. I'm very sorry. We're live now, I'm here with Rachel Dennison. Rachel, I'm so sorry, but can you reintroduce yourself for those who may not know who you are? <laughs> Yeah, of course. Um, so now your audio is. Do do I sound a bit broken up to you, audio wise? Oh, you sound okay to me. Okay. Do I sound okay? You sound a little bit robotic to me, but it may just be because I had. Uh, it says we have an excellent connection. And everything's fine. But I think it's temporary. Sorry about that, Rachel. Go ahead and. Okay, no problem. So, uh, my name is Rachel Dennison. And I am an assistant professor of psychological and brain sciences at Boston University. Uh, my lab studies visual per perception, attention, decision making, and awareness uh, using tools from cognitive and computational neuroscience and vision science. Okay. And for those of who are just joining us, we've been talking for a half hour already where I thought we were live. And unfortunately, there was one extra button to click. So it did not go through. Um, but we were discussing Rachel's work on attention and we were talking about temporal attention. So unfortunately that discussion, maybe I don't want to make us repeat it, but if I can just sort of summarize what I was taking away from, from what you were saying, and then maybe you could add to it if I'm missing anything, was that when we're talking about a temporal attention, we're talking about attention to a particular point in time when a task may be coming up and something is relevant. Um, like crossing a street, uh, et cetera, um, when you really need to pay attention at a particular moment. And what, what Rachel's work has uncovered in her lab is that uh, when you attend to a specific moment in a short window, you become better able to perform that task, but worse off right after and just before on a very short time scale. Uh, and then we were talking about a model, a mathematical model, which would dis which would describe that um, in computational terms. And, and I was asking for the specific explanation for how that was actually going to work. And that's where we just started actually live broadcasting. 
Um, and basically <laughs> what I was taking from what you were saying, Rachel, was that the, the way that this works is by actually adjusting the gain of these things sort of on the fly, live as it's happening, so that there's something that's monitoring the activity of those neurons and then adjusting how sensitive they are to the external world as it deems necessary. Is that too much of an oversimplification or did I miss anything important in what we were just talking about? I think that's exactly right. So, you know, the, the very simplest hypothesis is that um, visual attention in terms of when we're attending to specific visual information um, is implemented via some top-down gain modulation, which just means there's some modulatory signal uh, onto the visual cortex that's changing the sensitivity of the visual neurons. And when we think about temporal attention, which is you know, being able to prioritize some visual information at a specific moment in time that's very relevant to your task, um, our working hypothesis is that the gain of, of neurons is actually dynamically adjusted. So that at the moment when you, um, when you have to attend and you really have to see that information very well, uh, the gain increases. And at other moments uh, before and after, the, the gain is the gain is reduced. Yeah, good. Okay, so and I was going to ask you then about the relationship that you think uh, between the mathematical model um, and the set of equations that you developed uh, and the neural implementation of it, because I know you guys say in your paper that there's a couple of different ways that this could go actually. Um, so you're not, I don't know how committed you are to any particular neural implementation or if you have a favorite or something like that. But I, I am wondering about how you think that the, the brain might actually be doing this sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, this is a question that we're very interested in. And the nice thing about having a, a model, a computational model that's implemented at the level of neural populations uh, is that it actually makes predictions for what the dynamics of visual cortical activity would be if this model were correct. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, we can actually uh, just look at the sensory layers of this mathematical model, which is kind of formulated as a recurrent neural network. We can look at the sensory layers. We can see what the dynamics of those layers are. We can look at the voluntary attention layer of the model, we can see what those modulatory dynamics are. Um, and that's a prediction for what we might measure in a neuroscience experiment, where we measure activity from visual cortex, and where we measure the degree of uh, modulation of that activity in a top-down fashion. And so what we've actually been doing um, in my lab for the last couple of years, and this was work that I started when I was a postdoc with Marisa Cresco and David Heger at NYU, and we've continued doing it with um, students in my lab, is we're doing these neuroscience experiments. So we're, you know, measure brain activity uh, and use different techniques to track the modulatory influences on the visual cortex as the, um, you know, as the trial is unfolding and people are seeing these sequences of to stimuli usually is what we do to be very, you know, to be very simple. Mm -hmm. um, and we ask them to attend to the first stimulus. We ask them to attend to the second stimulus, or we sometimes ask them to attend to both stimulus. And then we can measure what's happening in the visual cortex and we can measure these modulatory influences. And we can ask, you know, does it match what the model predicted? Um, and if so, you know, that's a point for the model. And if not, that's our opportunity to revise the model. So more generally, I am curious about your view about how models relate to the wetware in the brain. So so do you think that like by finding this kind of evidence that you're finding that you're well increasing your own credence in thinking that this is the actual computation the brain uses? Or is this just a so I guess what I'm having in mind here is that the difference between, you know, taking the brain's point of view and the experimenter's point of view. So is this something that you think of as useful for describing the data we have? Or do you think this is actually what the neurons are doing, the kind of computation they may be implementing? 
So my my goal is to develop models that really are the computations that the brains are that the brain is implementing. Um, at least with this kind of model, you know that's the goal. We have the model is specified at level of neural populations exactly in order to be able to make these links between the model behavior and the me the neural measurements, um, and 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 of course the psychophysical measurements because the model can also output um, behavioral decisions. Um, and so that that's the general strategy that my lab is taking for this problem of temporal attention. And for, you know, mo most of the problems that we're working on is, you know, let, let's have this interaction between models, uh, computational models, which are mathematically defined, but that mo models that can make predictions about neural activity and models that can make predictions about behavior. And then let's measure the neural activity and let's measure the behavior and let's update our models and let's iterate. So that that's really the general strategy of of the of, of our of our research. Yeah, and that that's a perfect implementation of the strategy of uh, cognitive neuroscience um, as opposed to these topics. So it's interesting. By the way, one thing I forgot to mention that we were talking during the time when we weren't live but thought we were. Yeah. <laughs> was how there's a lot of interesting work to be done on temporal attention. And how, I'm wondering how many of the things that we've discovered about spatial attention will kind of carry over to temporal attention. Um, so it would be interesting to tune in to see. I know um, <clears throat> some of these questions are really empirically tractable, it seems. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I want to ask about some related work, but it's slightly different. So this has to do with your uh, work on the M and P pathway. Uh, the Magna and Parvo uh, pathways and the yeah. different contributions they might make. I mean, I think it's sort of indirectly related because ultimately if you're going to have a successful, like realistic model uh, of attention, then it's going to have to include these different contributions if, the, if there are, and I think your work suggests that there is. Um, so, so first I want to ask you about that and then how you think these may relate. But as far as I understand your work there, you guys are really showing that there's a difference in contribution, which reconciles a kind of debate uh, that people have been having in in the uh, you know what is that I know I'm blanking on the term but you know the you'll tell us what it is shortly I'm sure <laughs> the perceptual blinking between the face and the house what is that called again oh are you are you referring to the binocular rivalry that's the one yeah Eddie, <laughs> yeah yeah um, okay yeah so um, so this is work. I think the work that you're referring to is the work, some work that I did when I was a PhD student with um, with Michael Silver at UC Berkeley, and and you know I, I it actually fits really well with the uh, what I think is a a general theme that I keep returning to in my research and that I. Um, you know, and that I'm really excited about for my for my lab's direction, which is really um, thinking about the dynamics of visual perception and thinking about the dynamics of neural activity um, and trying to understand how they relate to each other and how we how we construct a visual experience that is actually structured in time, um, is actually kind of seamlessly structured in time and unfolds in this, you know, cinematic way, um, given the fact that the brain takes time to process information, that information has to travel from you know one point to the other and across many many different areas of the brain to analyze different aspects of the visual scene and then that information has to be all stitched together um and you know all these different steps take different amounts of time and occur at different latencies and this problem gets even more striking once you start thinking about a multi-sensory context when you know, you know, auditory information is processed, you know, at some latency, and visual information is processed at some other latency, and there's all these different steps through the hierarchy 
Um, and yet, you know, our, our actual perceptual experience is beautifully temp temporally structured and tends to match the temporal structure of the world. And so um, the, the studies that we were doing, uh, that, that I did with, um, with Michael Silver at Berkeley on the M&P uh, uh, roles of M&P systems in binocular rivalry, we're looking at this interesting, um, this interesting phenomenon in binocular rivalry, which is called, uh, some people call it interocular switch right. rivalry. The way it works is you, um, you have these, uh, so, so the classic setup of binocular rivalry is you present, you know, one image to the left eye, one image to the right eye, and, you know, usually when there are different images, you know, we always have slightly different images presented to the two eyes, and that's what gives us our uh, depth perception. Um, but in binocular rivalry, those images are very different, and they're incompatible. They can't be integrated in the normal binocular vision systems. And so what happens instead, which is, you know, very cool, is that you, uh, you see first one image, like the image in the left eye for a little while, and then your percept changes and you start seeing the image in the right eye and then it changes again. You start seeing the image in the left eye. Um, and this happens kind of outside of your voluntary control for the most part. Yeah, um, that's what I was talking about, the face in the house. That's the classical demonstration of that was a face in one eye and a house or a place in the other. And you get that popping back and forth. Right, exactly. Right. So so that's a that the face in the house is a really good way to to look at uh, neural correlates of binocular rivalry because you can you can measure activity in FFA for the face and you can measure activity of PPA for the house. and You can see how that how that changes. Um, but yeah, what, what happens uh, it, when you when you swap these images back and forth between the two eyes, you can start asking, is the percept that you're experiencing linked to what's in one eye? Or is it really um, at a higher level linked to a particular um, perceptual interpretation? Um, and the reason that that is a kind of elegant experimental strategy to, to look at that question is that if it's just linked to one eye, every time you swap the images back and forth between the two eyes, you should have a perceptual swap. Mm -hmm. um, but if it's linked to a higher level perceptual inference, swapping the images back and forth might not make any difference. And you might be able to have the sustained percept of just one of the, um, one of the images for longer you know, across multiple swaps, and um, and 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 indeed, under certain uh, stimulus conditions, it is the case that you get these longer sustained percepts. Um, and under other conditions, it seems that you get these more abrupt changes that are linked to the eye. And so, you know, a question is, well, what what determines when you have this more kind of eye-based percept versus this more stimulus-based percept? Right. And so to and the, to address the particular contributions of each pathway, you use a different stimulus. So you're using these gradings that are tilted in one way or, or, or another, but being presented to each eye so that you either get a train, a switching of the gradings that coincide with the stimulus or you get this. I forget what the terminology that used, but this random, this greater, this larger pattern. Um, and what you're what you guys were looking at in that. I didn't realize how old the paper or if it was older than you're more. I didn't realize it wasn't current. So sorry. <laughs> but it was very interesting when I read it. What you guys basically showed was that you can see that there's two different things going on here. One related to the expectation about uh, to how reliable the switch is or what's going to be there. And the other related to um, maybe attention or to something else. So, um, yeah, I mean, in, in, in that work, we were we were very interested in the, uh, you know, it, it had been found before that a variety of really seemingly low level properties of the um, of the visual stimulus could have dramatic influences on whether you saw this kind of eye based percept or this stimulus based percept. Um, and we wanted to understand the reason, the reason for that. And we had kind of noticed that some of these, um, some of these differences seem to map on some that had been observed before seem to map on to these two um, early parallel pathways in the visual system, which uh, which are the 
the manocellular or M pathway and the parvocellular or P pathway. And these pathways um, start very, very early in visual processing. Um, they're completely separated at the, at the level of the lateral geniculate nucleus, which is the kind of thalamic nucleus that sends visual information to the cortex. Um, and these pathways are very interesting when we're thinking about dynamic vision because they have very different um, spatial, temporal, and uh, color uh, sensitivities. Uh, so the, the M pathway has these kind of very transient responses to, to um, visual changes, and it responds very fast. Um, and it tends to respond to big, uh, uh, kind of low spatial frequency, you know, coarse scale, uh, fast changes. Um, whereas the P pathway um, is much more sustained. It tends to respond to, you know, detailed color vision that's more stable, and its and its responses are more sustained as well. Um, and you know, to make a long story short, what we found was that um, when we actually designed experiments to manipulate the stimuli so that they would be more targeted to the M pathway or to the P pathway, we could um, change the uh, rate of the you know, eye-based uh, percept versus the stimulus-based percept. Um, and uh, in, in a way that was kind of consistent with activity in the M pathway perhaps signaling this transient change that was associated with the eye swap, which would then let you actually perceive this transient uh, eye swapping pattern. Um, and if we reduce the activity in the M pathway, maybe kind of reducing the sensitivity of the system to these transient changes, um, people were more likely to see these more sustained percepts. So almost like, you know, so even though um, I've been using the terms eye-based and stimulus-based, um, and those are terms that other people have, have used in, in the literature, um, it, you know, these results suggest that it, it might not be uh, really competition at a monocular level versus competition at a higher level. But, you know, an alternative way of thinking about it is there's these different um, dynamic patterns of input and when you're doing perceptual inference, uh, maybe if you have more of this transit information, you're more likely to see this rapidly switching pattern. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're more likely to be signaled that like, oh, something has just changed. My inference needs to reflect that data. Yeah, I mean, I, I found that one of the reasons that I found this was interesting just because I you don't see even though there is this well-known anatomical difference in, in the visual system that everybody talks about in every introductory class, it's not studied at the at this level as much as you might think. Um, so it's interesting to see you guys doing that and then that you uncovered this interesting result that they make different contributions perhaps. Um, so, so that it, it does make me wonder how, if you think that these are the sorts of things we would need to account for in any successful model, which is what originally I was I was going for when I brought this up. And now I just realized I was mixing up some other paper of yours that I was talking about when I was talking about the expectation and attention. Um, so I want to ask about that after that. But I got flustered when I realized I'd made such a egregious error earlier. <laughs> so I was rattled. But anyway, so I'm sorry about that as well. But uh, so I, I wonder if, if you think that, uh, well, how much does this affect, generally speaking, our our models of a vision that we kind of neglect this or or not neglected but it's not formally accounted for in, in many of our models the difference between right i mean i mean um you know the um the the, the area that i think there's the most you know the most room for some interesting interesting advancement of our of our vision models is indeed in the in the realm of dynamics, um, is indeed in how we are able to process this continu continuous visual input and construct our, you know, 
perceptual experience as it unfolds over, over time. Um, and I think that uh, our foundational knowledge about the anatomy of the visual system and the low, low level um, processing in early parts of uh, you know, the visual stream uh, will probably be quite important for developing detailed models of that kind. Uh, because what's happening, you know, what's happening in the retina, what's happening in the LGN is really determining the kind of input that the visual cortex gets and the kind of input that, um, you know, then undergoes all those uh, hierarchical stages of processing to sort of form some perceptual, some perceptual inference. Um, but, you know, throughout the visual system, there's a lot of information about dynamics that's encoded. And that is something that we need, we need a, we really need to work on a more complete picture of how that dynamic information gets translated into our dynamic perceptual experience. Yeah, I think that's really an important point and, and one that a lot of people um, will kind of pay lip service to, I guess that you know the the brain is a dynamical system unfolding in time but then a lot of our models like you were saying we were talking about earlier they're static um and even the way we discuss the visual system it's in terms of the static hierarchies and we're like yeah there's a lot going on there but here's v1 then v2 and you're like mm. uh so it i think it's your work in part the overall approach that you're taking and that we've been talking about is this to bring in the dynamics part of it and to take seriously the idea that experience is something that unfolds in time and that therefore takes time um, and understanding the processes that lead up to the kind of experience we have uh, is is extremely important and hard to do actually, but they, the, the studies that you do are very interesting and clever. And that's what it takes is to get at these kind of questions is really interesting and clever experiments. Um, and a lot of the work, like it, it's one simple thing can make a big difference. Like what you were saying earlier is that you guys in your work, you present two stimuli, <laughs> and then you can cue the first stimuli or the second stimuli. You can play around with that that paradigm a lot, um, and it's a simple, seemingly simple innovation that um, that leads to a lot of experimentally rich ideas. So I, I really think that's interesting. Um, I was going to ask yeah. about. Sorry, mm -hmm. go ahead. Oh, I I was just going to say to that point that. Um... We we really do try to, try to be as simple as possible, and I think this is a I think this is a more general point uh, to make about when we're trying to develop, especially when we're trying to develop quantitative models of um, visual processing and perception and attention. Uh, you know, these are these are complicated. Um, you know, attention is a complicated cognitive process. Um, you know, perception is its own thing. Uh, we, we're trying to build models that we as humans can understand. I mean, that's part of my sort of philosophy about models is that they're, they're, for, they're for us, you know, they're for humans uh, to understand how these things work. Um, and so I think we, you know, for that reason, we, re we try to simplify our, exp our experimental designs as much as we possibly can um, while still retaining the manipulation that will let us answer our scientific question, you know, and, and that's, um, that's important for this strategy of then relating it back to the model and helping it, helping us to advance the model. The experimental design is too complicated, um, or the stimuli are too complicated and so on. It's harder, it's harder for us to, to make models that we can interpret. And so, um, that's just kind of a meta, you know, meta science point, yeah. which is, um, you know, when we're trying to make this, these links between models and behavioral and neural activity, uh, we often find that it really helps to simplify, you know, simplify as much as we, as much as we can, but, you know, not too much that we lose the, <laughs> we cure off the baby with the bathwater. Yeah, exactly. The key simplification, because you're right, sometimes you get the feeling that th there's too much trying to be, I mean, too many innovations to that spoil the design not uh, you read some of these things like okay this is too complicated to address the question could be done simpler so you want to make sure you don't leave it out but not over complicated 
And that's hard to do as a researcher. Uh, there's a lot of pressure to be clever. Yeah, it's a fine line, you know. And mo I mean, but modeling is a really humbling enterprise. You yeah. know, when you you're trying to build these models that are going to actually explain explain the data and be understandable to you, um, it's it's you know it really forces you it really forces you to think really hard about you know what ex what exactly the experimental design is and and you know what what exactly all the ingredients are. So when you say understandable to you, are you meaning to indicate not deep neural networks or something like that, or uh, like the opposite of that approach, something that you could see how it works? Is that what you mean by that? Or, or do you mean something? Yeah, that's what I, that's what I mean. And, um, um, and you know, I, I certainly think that there's a, you know, there's a, there's a lot of fascinating work being done in deep neural networks and it's an important you know, oh, yeah, development yeah. or that's uh for sure but um but yeah i think um you know different kinds of models have different purposes in science and um the kind of models that we were just talking about these normalization models of attention the um normalization models of dynamic attention that we've been developing um the purpose of these models, as far as I'm concerned, is for us to understand mm -hmm. the um, the mechanism and for us to be able to make predictions about uh, the brain and about behavior. And if, um, you know, it's not to say that when we build these models, we already know in our minds how they're going to behave, because sometimes we're surprised. Um, but it should be, it, it, we, we do find it helpful to build models that we can all we can ultimately even when they surprise us sometimes we can we can have a chance of figuring out oh this this is why you know this is why it had that kind of behavior in this situation right oh to just adjusting some parameter and then hoping it works and then uh, going. Right. <laughs> interesting okay so um uh i i wanted to ask about the the, the stuff that I was confusing when I was flustered a second ago, which was the relation between expectation and attention um, and how you can separate those out. Uh, because it, what I'm trying to ultimately get it to get us to talk about eventually is the idea of probabilistic perception and whether or not the perceptual systems use uncertainty and whether that entails that there is a probabilistic aspect to perception or not. Um, so I, I think this is a way to get into that topic. Uh, but so I, I wonder if first you could tell us a little bit about the work that you did, um, where you try to separate out this difference between the the contributions of the expectation versus your attending to the topic, and then we'll kind of go from there. Yeah, um, I think this is a very important distinction uh, between expectation and attention. Um, this is this is a distinction that has been made uh, in the literature, you know, first in the kind of uh, spatial and feature based attention expectation domains, for example, by uh, Summerfield and Egner. Um, and the the way that I would define the difference between expectation and attention is that a, expectation relates to the probability of something happening, the probability of a particular thing happening. Um, so, you know, if you have an expectation about, you know, um, uh, I I predict that the next thing that appears is going to be, you know, a lion or something like that, right? Um, uh, that would be a, a terrifying prediction, but, you know, you might be able to make that <laughs> prediction. Um, uh, atten attention uh, is is uh, what is actually what uh, information would actually be relevant to your task so you know um, in the example of a lion a lion is obviously quite relevant to your <laughs> task <laughs> um, but you know you might be able to make a different kind of prediction like oh i predict that there's going to be a um toad <laughs> you know um and I can predict with you know a great deal of certainty that there's going to be a toad coming <laughs> coming around the bend, but it doesn't matter. I don't care. You know, let the toad be the toad. Um, it's not particularly relevant for my task, so there's no reason for me to actually attend to that to that toad when it appears. Um, so you so these things are orthogonal in that way. You can um, have you can you can predict 
something that will occur and that thing can be either relevant or task relevant. And, and meanwhile, there can be something quite task relevant for you, but you cannot predict uh, you know, when, it, when it will happen and, and so on. Um, and so we've, we've uh, been doing work making this distinction um, it, this distinction has come up in a few different places in, you know, in my previous research. I'm not sure specifically which which one you're referring to, but um, recently uh, this distinction has been really important to us when studying temporal attention um, and temporal expectation. So in the time domain, um, the way this expectation attention distinction gets cashed out is uh, temporal attention involves a task relevant moment in time. So, um, you know, there's a, a time that you know there's going to be something that happens there that's very important for your task. Mm -hmm. Whereas temporal expectation is um, there's a time that you know something may ha happen, something is likely to happen, but it may not be relevant for your task. So, like an example I like to give in the temporal domain is let's say you're watching someone go up and go up an escalator. Um, you can watch someone go up an escalator and you can know when they're going to reach the top. And so you can predict the moment when they're going to reach the top. But it doesn't matter for you. You know, you're just a bystander. Like that is a random <laughs> guy on an escalator. It doesn't matter. Um, but if you're the one on the escalator, like you can predict the moment you're going to reach the top. So that would be temporal expectation. Um, but that moment is also task relevant for you because you're going to have to, you know, look at that moving edge of the escalator and prepare to step off the escalator and not get your shoelaces caught in the escalator and all that stuff. Right. So, um, <laughs> so uh, that would be an example of temporal attention with this task relevant moment. And so in a lot of the work that we've been doing recently with um, temporal attention, it's been very important for us to make that distinction between expectation linked to predictability and attention linked to task relevance, uh, because a lot of um, previous studies have um, used um, tasks where those two things are kind of uh, merged together. So you might have a stimulus occurring uh, at some more or less predictable time, um, but the stimulus is always task relevant. So you have both prediction and attention occurring together. Um, and so what what it means is we don't really know whether the mechanisms of that process and you know th those uh, processes that have been observed before are really related to the predictability of the stimulus like the timing predictability you know your ability to predict this interval over over which things are happening or are really related to the relevance of the moment in time that you know, you're trying to use for your behavior and so the way that we have dissociated this in our uh, in our experiments is by presenting these kind of two sequential targets where both targets are completely predictable. They always occur at the same fixed time relative to an init initial cue. Um, so you, so in every trial, you know exactly when those uh, stimuli are going to occur. They're completely predictable. Um, but we tell you, oh, the first one's going to be more relevant or the second one's going to be more relevant. And that's our way of sort of controlling temporal expectation while manipulating uh, temporal attention. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So and so in the uh, studies that I was reading, uh, this is the, the most recent one, I think, was you present the two stim uh, stimuli, but then you can present a, a cue that's either accurate or inaccurate. So you get the predictability measure uh, because the stimulus, they can expect it there. Um, but the, since the cue is kind of going to be reliable and you could adjust either how much or not, then you could really check to see whether they you give them some incentive to attend. Then you expect that they'll be, you know, attending there. Um, so then you could check when they were not preparing to attend, but still expecting right. to be there. So that's where you get that crucial right. distinction. Um, exactly. And so what do, you, what do we uncover when we do that? Right. So, um, so the first the first thing that we've found is that, and I think we 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 alluded to this a little bit at the beginning, but um, I'll I'll just say it once again is that um, when people are attending to a specific moment in time, their perception improves at that time, um, but it also is impaired at you know preceding and following times, and so what this means is that attention actually 
changes visual processing over and above uh, predictability, over and above specific predictability, you can, you know, zone, you know, hone in on that task relevant moment and it will change your perception. Um, we've, al we've also found that the behavior of uh, your micro cicades, so these little tiny eye movements that you're always making, even when you're not aware of it, and e even when you're fixating at a, a single location, those are um, suppressed. Those are suppressed, and it, they're suppressed before these predictable times, which had been observed before, but also the exact timing of the microsaccadic suppression um, depends on the precise moment when you're attending. So again, it's this um, another example of how um, temporal attention is, you know, sort of building over and above mere predictability to adjust the precise timing of these processes. Um, and now, you know, we have some new neural data that also shows uh, changes in visual cortical activity that are specifically linked to temporal attention, you know, again, over and above this temporal predictability or temporal expectation. Um, so that's, uh, you know, so, so that's what we're really working on now is trying to isolate these mechanisms of voluntary or goal-directed temporal attention when, you know, while we're controlling for predictability. Interesting. So when you found this uh, trade-off thing, it was still at the same time scale, 300 milliseconds or so, still at that very short time scale. Oh, right, right. So the the trade-off, uh, the trade-off between these two simuli, it, it happens, yeah, the, the peak is around 250 or 300 milliseconds. And then by the time the two stimuli are, if you place them, you know, even a second apart, um, the trade-off disappears. And it seems that you can actually, you know, maximally process both stimuli if they're far enough apart. And, you know, the way I like to think about it is, you know, this has to be true in some way, like you can attend today and you can attend tomorrow <laughs> and that's fine. Um, and the question is then really, you know, how close to, to these stimuli have to be to each other when they start to interfere? Right. Um, and on the time scale of perception, a few hundred milliseconds is what I would consider an intermediate time scale. You know, it's close, but it's not that close. Um, <laughs> it's, you know, it, it, it's not something that's as simple as, uh, you know, masking or that might happen in a very, very early stage of visual processing. It's not something that's mediated by, you know, very short time scale interactions that might happen, um, or, you know, or early in the visual system. Th this has to be something that involves um, uh, co temporal constraints that happen on a somewhat longer time scale. Mm. Um, and I'm very interested, you know, this is something that we're really interested in in, in, our, in the lab right now is thinking about this time scale, you know, this time scale of a few hundred milliseconds, which is um, really, I would say, the time scale of a lot of our uh, perception and cognition and yeah. behavior. You know, when we think about the rate of saccadic eye movements, you know, we're making saccadic eye movements every, you know, 300 milliseconds or so, we have 300, 500 milliseconds. Um, when we think about the uh, the rate of speech, you know, uh, syllables, it's all it's also on that order, you know, a couple hundred hundred milliseconds, you know, per little chunk. And and so this is um, I think of this hundreds of milliseconds time scale as like really core time scale to the way that our brain works and the way that our kind of um, cognitive processing and perception unfold. Um, and it's a question. It's a question is why that time scale? Right. You know, imagine an organism that went 10 times faster, um, you know, or 10 times slower. You know, um, it seems uh, that, you know, those, those would all be sort of theoretically possible. Um, so there must be something about the way that our, bra our brains are built. Um, that makes it so that we kind of tick along at roughly this time scale to sort of execute these like, chunks of processing. Yeah, I, I find that stuff very interesting. I'm a, I've been interested in questions like this since uh, grad school. For me, when I was reading a work by Rudolf Alinas and it's sort of the idea of a perceptual quanta and all that stuff is very interesting. Um, do you have any guesses as to the answer? I mean, my preferred guess is it has something to do with the waveforms 
um, which are important in brain processing like theta waves and so forth. Uh, but uh, do you have any of your favorite guesses? <laughs> Well, you know, the, the, I think there are a lot, there are a number of possibilities um, for the kinds of things that could lead to temporal constraints on on this time scale. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one one you just mentioned is um, these um, uh, rhythmic features of neural data like theta or delta right. oscillation. Um, you know, again, it's sort of like is that begging the question, like, you know, why, 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 do, you know, why theta and why not alpha or, you know, infraslow, you know, frequencies, <laughs> something like that. Um, but um, then if we talk about tuning of the neurons. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, and, I think there's and, like something about theta that helps the neurons sort of in tune to it or some uh, because of the way that they're built. So it could just come down to those kinds of principles. Yeah, there could be some sort of biomechanical reasons um, that certain time scales work, like biophysical reasons uh, related to um, ner single neurons or circuits um, and so forth. Um, so that's very interesting. Um, you know, there could be reasons re related to something about um, communication across the cortical networks or cortical thalamic networks mm -hmm. um, in terms of like how long does it take information to go here and there and uh, you know to um, on the one hand kind of converge on coherent interpretations or to you know do some readout processes that are necessary when you're doing actual tasks when you're you know making decisions and um, guiding behavior and so on um, and then you know, th there's other things about uh, competitive competitive processes in the in the brain, which you know we often think about as happening between um, neurons uh, that are simultaneously active, like you know mutual inhibition or something like that. But also, given you know, given the amount of time that it takes for information to kind of flow through the brain. Um, you know, there there are many neurons that have fairly long time scales of activity. And so, you know, this raises all kinds of questions about what kind of interference across time happens uh, and um, in the brain because of some of these temporal properties of, of these, you know, these systems, these circuits and so on. Um, yeah, so I think there are a lot of um, options. I don't think, you know, they're mutually exclusive even. Um, and that, and part of our, you know, part, part of why we're, we're actually really focused on uh, temporal attention right now in my lab is because this seems like a, seems like an experimentally, a really neat way of getting at these temporal constraints. You know, we see the temporal constraints in behavior. When you tend to one point in time, you better at that, better at that time, worse at surrounding times. Okay. Nailed it. That's the temporal constraint. Now, you know, we can also manipulate it. You know, we can manipulate the temporal constraint by let, letting uh, someone be cued to one point in time or another point in time. Uh, this causes the trade-offs. You know, this changes the prioritization of one time over another time. Good. Uh, so this is a, you know, this is an experimental strategy where we now have experimental control over how the brain is handling these temporal constraints. And so the hope is that now by you know looking at the neural activity and kind of tracking the information about these different stimuli as they flow through the the brain we can start to understand um, you know what what are the compensatory strategies that the brain is using to to prioritize one stimulus in the presence of these temporal constraints mm -hmm. um, which hopefully will also give us insight into what those temporal constraints actually are yeah. Do Do you think this time scale has effect at the like everyday level? So I'm I'm wondering if you misjudge the timing of something, and you think it's going to happen at like a fraction of a second earlier, then you may be attending too early, and that's going to make you do worse a fraction of a second later when it actually shows up. Um, you know, like you're crossing the street and you misjudge how far the car is away or something like that, or and you're reaching for a ball, trying to catch a ball that someone's throwing at you, you misjudge the angle, or I don't know, these sorts of things, do, or is that too short of a timescale 
to have these kind of practical impacts, do you think, in the 300 milliseconds? You know, I, 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 think, I think that it's possible. Um, and I think that uh, the, the, the place where we're, mo we're most likely to see really significant effects of uh, this time scale are, are cases where people are being, you know, pu actually pushed the, to their performance limits. You know, we think about these high, high, high demand, high performance activities that we, you know, that we value a lot, like um, uh, people who are, you know, top level athletes or musicians or, you um, uh, fighter pilots or, you know, but even in simple, even a more simple situation of driving a car, like usually um, the, the way that our roads are constructed and that the spacing of the signs is, you know, put out on the highway, it, it, it respects, it respects the temporal constraints that we have and tries not to overload them. Um, you know, but in certain situations, you may get into a demanding setting where you have a lot of simile at coming coming at you. Um, and you uh, the fact that you could um, not process all of that information uh, could could really lead to some trouble. You know, like if some someone pulls out in front of you unexpectedly and there's something else, you know, something else you're like, that you're were already paying attention to. I mean, that this is the kind of situation where your those temporal constraints become quite apparent, and um, you know can really matter. Is this the sort of thing that if we were to build an artificial agent, is this the type of constraint we would want to build into that agent, or is it the type of thing we want to engineer out as much as possible? That's a good question, and and I I think. It's hard to it's hard to say because we don't I think we don't really know why the temporal constraint exists now, um, you know, um, and I think the answer to that question probably depends on the reason. You know, if the temporal if the if the exact magnitude of the temporal constraint that we have in our biological brains has some um, has some good reason from an engineering perspective for kind of like processing and making inferences about the world, like that's that's one thing. Um, if it comes from, you know, the way that it, ha it has to be implemented in the brain using biology, using neurons, using circuits, you know, then maybe artificial systems, um, you know, would not be subject to the same temporal constraints. Interesting. Um, so I want to ask, I know we're running out of time here, uh, but I want to ask about uh, phenomenology or experience more generally, which is what motivates a lot of your work um, and what, understanding how the, you know, perceptual experience is constructed in time, um, the, how the process actually unfolds is a central concern, but we haven't really talked too much about it as of yet. <laughs> a lot of the stuff has been the forefront of it in mechanics of the mechanisms, computations, the neurons and stuff. So I am wondering about your, um, maybe your background, like what you think about perception generally, um, and then we'll sort of dig in on how it relates to these models and things we've been talking about. So what, what is your view of perception? So open-ended question for you, Rachel. <laughs> open-ended question, yeah. Um, the way I think about, the way I think about perception is very much in the tradition of um, you know, the kind of Helmholtzian tradition of uh, perceptual inference. So, um, you know, which has, which these days we might, we might think about in a Bayesian framework. Um, so the idea that uh, we're getting data on our sensors, on our, on our retinas, on, you know, the sensors and other um, sensory modalities. And the, the brain has to interpret that data to make an inference about kind of what was it out there in the world that caused that pattern of light to fall on our retina, for example. Um, so, you know, this inference process where you're getting sensory input and you're constructing um, an interpretation of what was, what would have been, in, what would have had to be in the world to cause visual information. So on this way of talking about perception, it's okay to say there's unconscious perception. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, um, perception uh, is a, 
a term that people <laughs> use in different ways, just like <laughs> most modern terms. Um, and and yeah, I think uh, uh, you could you could use the term unconscious perception to refer to um, you know the the visual processing that kind of um, un going on under the hood that that leads ultimately to these perceptual inferences. Is there anything that you would call a, a, per a perception that is uh, of the same kind as like the thing we experience, but not conscious? Or do you not allow that? I'm just curious, like how you use the terms. I'm not really, don't have anything that I'm aiming for. I'm just trying to figure out how you use the terms. Um, I, I'm not sure if I'm too dogmatic about the use of perception per se. I think it's just, I think it's usually more useful to just say conscious perception mm -hmm. or, um, you know, I think usually when people use the term unconscious perception, they're talking about some, you know, maybe stages of the perceptual inference that are happening, um, uh, which, you know, those stages may or, uh, may not be may not be conscious. But the way the way I think about it, is, you know, there's some visual processing that happens, um, and it's doing some perceptual inference. It's, you know, it it may involve a lot of sophisticated computations. Um, and then it kind of produces this result, which is like the inference. Um, and that inference is what we consciously experience. Okay. Interesting. Um, so yeah, because I, th I think some people use the term unconscious perception and what they mean is something of the same psychological kind as the thing, which is conscious, but just not so happen to be conscious. So um, as opposed to some lower level processing. But I agree with you that these terms are thrown all over the place, which is why I wanted to kind of to get clear about this. So uh, when you say, because um, now I'm thinking about this paper that you co-authored with uh, a few people, but one of them was um, Block, Ned Block and Doby, and one other person whose name is escaping me, uh, but it was on probably. Yannicka, Yannicka, you hate? Yes, sorry about that, Yannicka. Um, yeah. So uh, this Block on Probabilistic Perception, and so when you are arguing for that, this is the same definition of perception you're using there. So it's supposed to be conscious perception, the output of the inference, uh, what the thing which we experience, which is probabilistic in some sense. Or so, so, so my, yeah, so my, my view there is that, um, the, the computations going into perceptual inference, uh, may be probabilistic. Um, and, you know, we can talk about there are different ways of being probabilistic and what does it mean and how probabilistic. And, and that's where I think, you know, probably most of the scientific meat is, is sort of answering these more graded questions. Um, but uh, I, I wouldn't, I, my personal view is that the kind of output of those computations, you know, the computations may be probabilistic, but um, uh, the output into our conscious experience, sort of the character of our conscious per per experience, um, I don't see that as probabilistic. Okay. Um, and the reason, and, and, and the way, the way I would explain that view is that um, to me, probabilistic implies many simultaneous possible interpretations, mm -hmm. um, many alternatives that are simultaneously experienced. Um, and I think uh, conscious perception actually really kind of notably doesn't have that property. Right. Um, and that goes back to some of the work we were talking earlier about binocular rivalry, which is one of these classic examples where it's not that you have an experience of both options at the same time, but you know, one feels more probable and the other feels less probable. You you really just have a single uh, percept, a single perceptual interpretation, and the other option is completely unavailable to your conscious experience. Uh -huh. um, even though it you know is clearly represented somewhere in the visual system, and you know could gain steam I again think. and be conscious mm -hmm. again later. 
yeah that was confusing me because i i wasn't sure uh so so when when you say that perception could be probabilistic what you mean is that the processes that lead up to what we call the conscious perception might make use of or might it somehow embody the axioms of formal probability theory in the way that they work. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, I, I, I think there are two. I think there are two ways in which I think perception, uh, you know, or perceptual processing, you know, could be probabilistic. Um, one is in the course of perceptual inference. Mm -hmm. So you know, classic example um, would be. I'll give you two examples. One is. Um, the uh, you know the famous checker shadow illusion where you have this checkerboard and there's an object sitting on the checkerboard it casts a shadow yeah. over the checkerboard and um, you see the the square uh, the squares that are covered by the shadow the perceptual interpretation is that the color of those squares is like what the color of the paint on the checkerboard would be. Um, even though the actual um, luminance of that part of the checkerboard is is quite is quite different, um, you don't see the you don't consciously experience the luminance. You consciously experience the paint color, um, but experiencing you know having arriving that perceptual inference seems to involve some uh, you know. It could be explained by a Bayesian inference process where you have, you know, multiple causes, you have the cause of the shadow, you have the cause of the paint, and you're, um, you know, you're interpreting the data, which is the luminance, and making an inference about, oh, you know, it must be that this, you know, this shadow has to be discounted because um, it contributes in some way to the luminance. Okay, so that kind of perceptual inference process, I think, is happening all the time in our visual systems. Uh, it's con you know it's a very sophisticated uh, uh, computations in, in, in my uh, understanding, and um, it's uh, it wouldn't make sense. Uh, and there's various pieces of evidence for the brain to be using um, some kind of probabilistic computations in order to solve that inference problem. Um, so that's kind of one you know one way that you could cash out. Um, probabilistic perception or uh you know in, in in that in that inference process and then and then the other way people often talk about probabilistic perception which i also agree with is going from um uh you know what the question is kind of what information is available to downstream computations that might be involved in perceptual decision making decision making for example so um <clears throat> um, so, for example, uh, if uh, if the output of perceptual inference is just this point estimate, what we would call this point estimate, meaning like a single valued interpretation of some visual feature, um, like, oh, the the cup is exactly, you know, eight inches from me or something like that. Um, if that were the only information that were passed on to downstream computations, you, you wouldn't be able, you, you would have certain patterns of behavior that, you know, that are limited to make, being able to make use of that limited information. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't seem like that's what's happening. It seems like uh, uh, in decision-making, we have access to much more information than that. It seems like we use that information in a statistically appropriate way. So according to you know, um, you know what what you would want to do if you had access to probability distributions, and so um, so I think you know there's plenty of data that we have access to more than a point estimate in these downstream computations that we use for perceptual decision making. Uh, we have access to that information when we make our confidence judgments or confidence reports. Um, the question is, you know, how, how much information do we have access to later on? Um, at what points in the system is information lost? Um, what kind of information is retained and what kind of information is lost? And then what are the specific kinds of computations that are actually happening? Because, 
Um, uh, you could have computations that are perfectly Bayesian and statistically uh, perfect, but they're making use of degraded information. So, you know, so the answer isn't perfect. Um, or you could have kind of rough approximations of Bayesian computations that make use of really good information. And again, the answer would still not be perfect. So I think that's where, that's the, you know, where a lot of the real kind of empirical work needs to be done, just figuring out, you know, what information is available and when, and what are the actual computations that are being used to make these perceptual decisions. So the, so the probabilistic view, you said this earlier, but it's committed to this idea that there's multiple representations uh, or that are competing in a sense, sort of, or that you, well, I think we summed over actually is what it is, but uh, so that, uh, that they're all there. But I take it that the alternative is that there's just like a point, a single representation with a probability estimate attached to it. Um, maybe something like, you know, red there 75 percent maybe or something like that so that you have the, the probability that the statistical information but also the single representation without multiple representations are, are is that what the difference between your view and block and doby's view was in this uh paper or did i misinterpret that yeah so i so maybe it would be helpful to kind of spell out a few different options for yeah. these probabilistic views. Um, so starting with the really uh, no, there's just no probabilistic information at all, that would be like just the point estimate. There's only a point estimate. At the very other end of the extreme is there's a full probability distribution uh, present. And when we say probability distribution, here, we really mean uh, with respect to some visual feature. So for example, let's say again, we're thinking about like the distance of something from us. Um, the full probability distribution would mean um, there's information that could let us read out um, the probability that the cup is exactly eight you know, inches away, and also the probability that it's exactly 11 inches away, and also the probability that it's exactly 3.5 inches away. So there's there's information in, uh, in the representation that could let us extract the likelihoods of different, um, all the different possible distances of the, of the cup. And so this would be like, um, we, we, we might think of this as like a posterior probability distribution over the distance that that cup is away from us. Um, so that's the that's the extreme example on the probabilistic end. Um, um, and you know you could add and you know that full probability distribution's worth of information is used probabilistically. like it's used in, in terms of uh, that information gets combined with other information in, according to the rules of probability and so forth. Um, so I think of I think of the full probabilistic view as like a combination of the nature of the representation, like there's a lot of information uh, that could be used to get probabilities for any any possible outcome you might want, um, and there's specific computations, you know, there's specific specific ways that that information is used that respects um, uh, statistics. Right. Um, so, so it could go wrong in a couple of ways, right? It could not do that empirically. It... That's right. So it could it could it could not do that empirically, or there might not be enough information. So the so one intermediate view that you just suggested, and this is one that um, you know Adobe and Ned have suggested. Although I will say that um, I think the I think your you you, you uh, the, the preprint that you're referring to is one that we're still um, we're we're actually uh, revising. And this is, uh, you know, this has been this has actually been a really interesting paper because um, Yannicka and Doby and Ned, uh, we all had, you know, a lot a series of conversations trying to, you know, really work out these different alternatives in in terms of what what would it mean to, you know, to say that perception is probabilistic and and what is the current current evidence that, you know, um, and how does it relate to those options? So like the intermediate view that you just said. Uh, would be, well, maybe there's just a point estimate plus um, some other 
single number that indicates the level of uncertainty uh, uh, in terms of maybe a standard deviation of a Gaussian distribution or something else. Yeah. Um, so that would be a much that would be a much sparser representation. Um, in some cases, you could use that kind of representation to read out probabilities of all the different options, like when the underlying distribution was Gaussian. Uh, but in some cases, you know, you couldn't. You couldn't represent more complex probability distributions, for example. And so that kind of intermediate representation would be a, you know, would represent some loss of information. And so you think that's a accounts against it? Um, I, well, or are you just thinking I, that it's not, so that's an empirical question, whether there is all that information there or some of it's lost. That's right. I think it's an empirical question. And I think, and I think the answer will probably end up being uh, fairly nuanced because I think it may um, depend on, you know, at what stage in neural processing are we talking about, you know, how much information is there and, um, and what, um, you know, what approximations needed to be made uh, in order to represent that information and so on. So I think I think it, I think the question really comes down to you know how much information is available, how much information is lost, at what stages do, do all those things happen, and then what are the computations that then make use of the information that is available? Do those computations operate in a probabilistic fashion, um, or, do, or do those computations really just do something more heuristic um, uh, that usually gets the job done? but doesn't really respect the um, you know, rules of probability. Interesting. And so just one question back to relate this to the phenomenology or to the conscious perception. So oh. I understand what you what we're talking about now, but do you think there's any aspect of conscious perception or phenomenology, which is maybe not probabilistic, but uh, generic or abstract or not precise or somehow represents possibilities in a smeared out way or do you think that uh, perception is always like precisely defined phenomenologically wise or do you not have an opinion <laughs> yeah i mean i think this is a really interesting question um and i yeah i i i dealt with some some of these issues in the the one the one philosophy paper i i have i have ever written um which uh you know was thinking about um, the notion of perceptual precision. So um, I think uh, in terms of our phenomenal experience, we have a single interpretation of what's happening, but various aspects of, our, of that interpretation are associated with uncertainty. Um, and, and so, you know, one, one example, that I think about is if I, you know, if I hold up some object uh, in my periphery, um, my interpretation on the one hand is that it is occupying one specific location, mm -hmm. uh, but I also have a sort of smeared out sense of what that location is. Like I don't have very good uh, resolution about what that location is. And so the question is, you know, how can we how can we characterize that aspect of phenomenology? You know, um, one one view which I which I don't like is to say, well, we see it, we actually see the thing in multiple locations and attach different probabilities to those locations. Um, that doesn't quite seem right to me in terms of, you know, just from inter introspection. Um, but another view, what which I would prefer is, um, well, we we interpret it in one location, but but we also have a sense that the information we have about its location is is imprecise. We kind of, you know, it's a bit coarse grained. It's a bit indeterminate. Um, so that's, um, yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So that would be phenomenologically, then you would capture that by not saying that it's 
representing different probabilities of things being here or there or there, but that is just kind of like a more vague or a, more of a sense of something being there as opposed to it actually being located there. I would say that you see it in a location, but with a low precision. But with a low precision. But what does the low precision part mean? The low precision means that um, your um, your phenomenology, yeah, in the sense of your phenomenology, um, I mean, it's interesting, right? Because you can describe you can describe your phenomenology at different at different levels. Um, so, you know, if I were going to make a impressionist painting of what I of what I saw, I could probably do that fairly exactly by, um, you know, kind of putting bits of paint all around this general region to to capture the imprecision of my experience. Right. Um, at the same time, if I were going to make an interpretation about where the object is, so an inference about the location of the object, um, I would not say it's in all those locations. You know, I would not say it's in multiple locations. I would say it's in one location, um, but I just can't tell very well what that location is. Yeah. And do you think that the probabilistic, if there are probabilistic processes that lead up to perception, that they influence conscious perception in any way or have they by that point disappeared completely in your view yeah i mean i think that the um i think that this uh yeah there are different ways of thinking about this and i do think it's helpful to sort of maintain the idea of the hierarchy of um uh, of visual processing and think about okay what is the representation at multiple levels and what is the phenomenology at multiple levels? Because I also think our phenomenology has, you know, multiple simultaneous um, attributes mm -hmm. uh, that we can access. You know, we can access, like I said, this kind of like pointillistic, you know, rendering of our experience, or we can access the interpretation about, you know, what, like, where is that thing and like, what color is it, you know, and stuff like that. Um, I think that um, the uh, the information that's present in the neural representations in the visual system, you know, gets translated into those aspects of our, our phenomenology. Um, and so it might be the case, for example, that, um, you know, at a, at a fairly, you know, low level of the visual system, we have, you know, we have a population activity of neurons that um, has uh, uh, has information in it about you know that could be could be read out as probabilities by decision processes and so forth mm -hmm. uh, you know some kind of distribution of activity which is imprecise you know which has um, stronger firing for location for you know eight centimeters away and like less fire or, or you know you can think of different ways of, of cashing this out um, but so that pattern of activity may contribute to this sort of like pointillistic uh, aspect of our phenomenology, which feels imprecise. Hmm. Um, but then at a later step, uh, reading out that activity could give like a best guess as to where the where the thing actually is. Interesting. And that could contribute to the, you know, to the kind of singular aspect of our inference about like, well, I think it's I think it's there. Um, you know, but we might have access to, you know, even if even if in our phenomenology, um, you know, our phenomenology has these sort of like singular interpretations because we have these multiple levels of representation, um, we may be able to use that to actually, you know, to to make guesses and things about where things are to to make richer descriptions of where things are likely to be sort of given our full phenomenology. And that would be a cognitive process, right. you know, maybe it would be a decision process to say, well, let me inspect this phenomenology at all its different levels. And I can make some, you know, actually, I can actually give some fairly rich information that would be like, you know, the likelihood of where this thing is. 
And in fact, there's some, you know, it's a nice recent study from um, Daryl Fooney's lab that shows that if you if you ask people to make sort of multiple guesses about, you know, what shape they think something has, um, you know, they, they can give you more information in subsequent guesses than in just the first guess. Mm -hmm. And I think that's consistent with like, um, you know, a lot of uh, the perceptual decision making literature that shows that we have access to pretty rich information or, or uh, cer certainly more than a point estimate's worth of information um, about about things. And I think there's this sort of open question of, you know, when we make those decisions, is it that we are um, unconsciously accessing the neural representations that are very rich um, and reading out rich information from those representations? Um, or is that is it that we are, um, you know, consciously inspecting our, our phenomenology and sort of using the multiple uh, layers that we that we have to you know, make a, um, make these kinds of perceptual or, me or like metacognitive decisions? Yeah, interesting, huh? A whole new can of worms just got opened up there. Well, uh, <laughs> that that's super interesting. I mean, there's so much fascinating stuff in your work. I could talk to you forever, but I know time is running out and I have to let you go. But at the end, I just want to ask you if there is anything that you were hoping would come up during this discussion, which hasn't yet come up, which you wanted to talk about. <laughs> and the answer can be no. <laughs> that is fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there is there is something that I wanted to mention uh, on your consciousness podcast, uh, cool. which is. Um, yeah, which is just something that I would really love to see um, in the field of consciousness science, uh, which is, and it's funny, we, we yeah we didn't we didn't talk too much about this at all, so I'll bring it up now. We, I would love to see um, a list, a list of uh, properties of consciousness, uh, of conscious experience, of human human conscious experience um, that we would that we would as a field like like to explain. Um, and um, it, the analogy that I think of is, you know, um, uh, consciousness sometimes feels like such a you know big problem to tackle. Um, if we think about something else like uh, the problem of, you know, what is life? How do like what is life? How does it work? And I and I know people give this example, but I think it's a useful example um, because you know in biology now we have some understanding about various properties of life, right? Like properties like um, oh how does how do uh, how does energy work and um, how do things grow and reproduce and move right. and you know things like that. So you know once you break it down into those different properties, you can really start to make progress. And I think um, in the science of consciousness, it, it could be really useful um, for for us as a kind of community to get together and make a list, you know, a list of of, of the of the kinds of properties that uh, that we want to be able to explain uh, about phenomenal experience, um, and uh, and then you know, and I, I think this is uh, people different researchers currently are tackling a lot of a lot of these properties, but maybe it would be helpful to have a more sort of unified um, effort to kind of uh, just write some down. Yeah, maybe so, even have like a, a joint statement, you know, like they've had about animal sentience or whatever important issue, a bunch of scientists come together and say, well, these are the things we think are important. So it'd be, it would be, I think, very important to have such a list. Now getting all these people to agree on anything like a list would be a take a conference in a millennia. But what, but I agree with you. This is something because there's a lot of work on consciousness and then it's like, okay, some that it's like, and then we're off to the races, everyone using their own methodology, their own preferred approach, but there is no agreed. Uh, I mean, this is a non sequitur, but I'm, I'm sort of thinking it reminds me of Thomas Nagel's call for an objective phenomenology. Um, and you don't even need to go that far. Some like way to describe experience without using experiential terms or something. But but something about the dynamics, characteristics of human experience that we would agree if you could predict, explain and manipulate these things that would go that would count as having something to do with experience, because there is not really an agreement on that, <laughs> as a matter of fact, <laughs> especially amongst per, per, uh, protagonists of specific theories of consciousness. Yeah, let's make a list. Yeah, I agree. Let's do it. 
Okay, well, thank you very much. I think that's an important call for action for the field. Um, Rachel, it's been a great pleasure. I really want to apologize for the for the mix up at the beginning of the stream. So the conversation at the beginning feels a bit um, uh, part of it's missing is because it is. But uh, nonetheless, I still I, I want to thank you for your time. This has been a, a great conversation. I myself have learned a lot um, from it, and I uh, highly recommend your work to anyone interested in this in these questions. And um, I, I really like it when you step out of the, the kind of particular questions you're interested in and address these bigger questions. So maybe maybe a book will be in the work uh, where you're putting all this together. That'd be that'd be pretty cool. Um, but uh, we'll have to stay tuned for that, I suppose. Um, in the meantime, let me just say thank you and uh, stick around for one second. I'll say bye out there. But once again, thanks for joining me. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you so 